Since its discussion has its roots in values, equity, and compassion, it's important to acknowledge that my part of this meeting is being held on the traditional lands of the Miami, Delaware, Potawatomi, and Shawnee peoples. Even though the state of Indiana has only recognized two of these groups with any land repri repatriation, I pay my respect to all their elders, both past and present. More importantly, I, I encourage you to hear from these groups themselves and two such sources for the groups here in Indiana um, are uh, displayed on your screen. Um, uh, www.miamiindians.org and the other uh, address is www.bokeganband-nsn.gov and the image that you're seeing is an overlay from uh, the website native-land.ca a uh, Canadian organization that ha is this map is crowdsourced by uh, the groups themselves, and it shows uh, the overlapping and complex uh, land uh, rights that encompass not only uh, the United States, but Canada as, and South America as well. So this is, as Charity said, ask an evaluator balancing data needs with reality. Um, my name is Jeremy Fouts. I'm the principal of the STEAM work group. We do um, research and evaluation for uh, cultural arts organizations, science organizations, um, and have been doing so for about 10 years or so. Uh, my own personal background is in ethnomusicology. Um, I did my field work in the Republic of Georgia. I also taught for several years uh, music education in the classroom. Um, what that has to do with evaluation and research, uh, the educational element ties in very nicely because I have experience um, in uh, formal education settings. Uh, much of our work um, does happen in the formal spheres. Um, but we also work with uh, museums and informal learning environments as well, um, where you're dealing with uh, very complex and varied environments, um, much in the same way that we would be dealing with in ethnomusicology, uh, where I had my formal training in um, research methodology. The talk here and what you're seeing on your screen uh, to kind of help illustrate this in one way, uh, you're seeing um, ver a very modern version of an ancient tool for building uh, called the plumb bob. Our, works, our work and lives are all a question of balance, even in normal times. It's just a bit more present maybe at this point. For today's talk, we're going to explore the balance of evaluation and our current moment. And this moment should help us be attentive to structures, systems, situations, and for this ethnomusicologist, uh, and people that have been around us the whole time. Some of you probably know, and if you do, please forgive me, uh, but this is a picture of various modern types of the plumb bob. A plumb bob is really just a weight on a string, and the string can be coated with chalk for marking. You hold onto the string patiently, letting the plumb bob hang down and balance, and gravity does the rest, pointing the plumb bob to the earth. Now you have a straight vertical line that you can trace or snap with a chalk on another surface, or a pointer that shows you exactly where to lay your foundation. Properly used, it can help align all kinds of structures so that they are straight and in line, safe 
strong relative to your ground, relative to uh, the most solid part, the earth. The plumb bob can come in different materials, shapes, and sizes, just like evaluation methodologies or techniques. Some are made for actual use. Some are made for display, but that's a soapbox for another time as far as evaluation is concerned. But the central claim I'd like to make here is that like a plumb bob always points to the ground, your evaluation approach and methodology always points to your values, even if like gravity, those values are unseen. When Charity and I were talking about how to frame this topic, I somewhat seriously suggested this title, Audience Research in a Time of Crisis, Don't. Uh, clearly, this is not in my best interest professionally, since I am an evaluator after all. Uh, being employed is pretty great. So why do I make this questionable business decision to tell you not to do anything that would involve uh, me or my colleagues. Some of it relates to my training and experience as an evaluator, ethnomusicologist, and teacher. But that in turn flows from my values. This quip comes from a place we, as informal learning and cultural institutions, should at least consider. I know I'm feeling extraordinary stress and responsibility, and I know I'm not alone in this. From a compassion standpoint, I'm worried about doing harm. And we'll talk more about that later. I have substantial questions on the reliability of audience data at this time. For many of us, our lives have been out of sorts, to say the least. Even weeks in, our context and daily lives continue to evolve in ways that would have been hard to predict even with the most rigorous statistics. There's so much uncertainty, even for those like me that are planners and privileged to be flexible in lots of ways that much of our population and much of our communities are not. Even so, I barely know what the next week will hold schedule-wise, never mind a month from now or some of the surveys that we're seeing two or three months from now. I have questions about the study methodologies I'm seeing. I've seen too few good surveys and so many bad, even from some large research and evaluation groups and associations. There was, and maybe still is, an almost pathological need to be doing something, anything, to show our colleagues, visitors, funders, sponsors, and boards that we care, and we surely do care. We're all trying to figure this situation out, all while we ourselves are under 20 different kinds of terrible flavors of stress. I totally understand this and I empathize. Like I said, we are all in this. Uh, we're all dealing with this together. What makes me, all of this makes me wary of any research and evaluation being done right now um, in general. And I think that's healthy, even as we find a way to cut some paths forward. I also have value, a question as to the values and motives of some of the things I'm seeing. The thing is, I've heard some very smart people say to just keep gathering that data, just as you always did and perhaps with even more insistence. Or, I've seen some very large uh, firms breathlessly reporting tiny changes in audience data that they're constantly collecting, all while giving very little context and providing almost no transparency. Data gathering organizations have much to gain at this time, ranging from adware, that looks like educational technology to certain survey platforms. Uh, and the example that I'm going to give is um, from a, a post that went out um, from a large survey uh, company. Um, 
that has uh, a close relative of our species in it in the name. Um, and the the blog post, uh, it was it meant it was it was wrapped in a layer that was making it look like these were findings. Um, and the point of this thing was, will people be taking? Do people want to take surveys now? Okay, that was the, that was the research question. And um, their end result was, yeah, they do. Okay, well, I had some questions about that. And uh, the, the, the whole report uh, of this post was about five or six paragraphs long. So it was very, it was missing a lot to come to such a clear conclusion. One of the questions I had was, what was the sample like? Uh, geography and other demograph demographics very likely matter. Aside from that, the sample uh, details matter because their panelists that this sur that this survey company is drawing from aren't typically compensated with any sort of incentives, which points to certain kinds of privileged situations. There's a question of values and motives. Does the survey company think you should keep surveying? Why, yes. Yes, they do, as a matter of fact. Which, again, uh, you, you start to wonder about um, with good reason. Does the purpose of the survey matter? Does the source of the survey matter? What about the participant's relationship with the survey source? Again, of course, all of this very likely matters, but instead of giving us context or a, even addressing any of that, we get oversimplification, in fact, the exact opposite. And lastly, uh, <laughs> for the purposes of, of uh, this, this uh, talk, this example, complexity and colliders are everywhere in this uh, study that the, the survey platform has done, and they're not acknowledged whatsoever. There's all these hidden variables that are likely at play, and instead you get just a simple clear-cut answer. All of this shows that values, that the values that are supporting the activities and behavior of these companies uh, influence what's going on with their instruments, with their reporting, just like the plumb bob, okay? Referring back to that, um, back to that metaphor. And unfortunately, these values aren't always, or rarely, rooted in equity or in a mission that serves the public good. But as museums, art organizations, and informal learning institutions, we can do better. Our missions, by and large, with probably very few exceptions, do serve the public good. So we have to conduct evaluations. So if we have to conduct evaluations during a crisis, or if we want to continue to build our evaluative thinking in our organizations, I'd ask you to consider using the following general guidelines. And the, uh, this is kind of the uh, map for the rest of this talk here. We've set the contact, we've set the kind of my initial misgivings with doing any research and evaluation right now. But if you're going to do it, um, or if you have to do it, this is what I would suggest. Number one, know why you're doing it in the first place and the types that you have going on. Uh, balance the many contexts in play. Prioritize your data needs. Focus on those needs with your methodologies. And lastly, rebalance everything with access by considering access and privilege. As a last caveat before I go on to the next slide, um, it may be that we need organizational elements and people with expertise to do these things. And establishing them right now, especially, may mean the organization uh, or even we as a field can't just jump right in. And that is perfectly okay and understandable. You should not feel pressure. Uh, 
you might need to do some capacity building before you can uh, move on or, um, it, and again, this is if you have to do evaluation. So this gets to why we are doing evaluation. What are the types of evaluation that are typically being done in these contexts? Um, the first one, um, exploring usage, outcomes, and or impacts for recently ended programs or for our likely many online offerings. Um, I see this as generally legitimate and uh, something that um, might need to be done, um, especially as you're trying to establish should we continue to put money into um, our online offerings. Um, the short videos that we're putting on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, et cetera, or on our own websites even. Um, or, if, it's, if a program ended uh, two months ago and we're trying to uh, assess the um, uh, impacts of that program, sure. Um, but even then, we need to take uh, certain things in a, into uh, consideration here. Um, the second kind uh, that's going to learning of needs during the crisis learning of what your audience, uh, your audience sometimes being vulnerable populations, what do they need during this time? Uh, exploring the nature of museum life when some normalcy returns and we can safely gather is the third type of evaluation that I'm seeing. Um, and lastly, uh, some of the evaluation I'm seeing is trying to explore the impact of the crisis for audience regarding mission specific topics, as in um, how does the uh, crisis affect your audience's views on climate change? Uh, we're seeing, uh, because people aren't traveling as much, we're consuming less, far less fuel. Um, as far as transportation, uh, maybe even um, uh, climate control in our buildings, et cetera. Um, you're seeing visible effects of that. Uh, I have not just ducks in my um, drainage ditch slash creek in the backyard. I have ducks walking regularly in my road uh, in the street outside uh, of the house. So how does that affect my ideas of conservation? of environmental impact of humans. One of the things I, you might notice is that uh, in uh, listing these types, I'm saying exploring. Um, many times for most of us, what we're doing uh, in our evaluation work, even if it's unstated, we're not, we're, we're taking a snapshot in time, uh, in that context, in that place, right? Right now, because of so much uncertainty, we're exploring these things. We're not determining these things. Uh, there's no, uh, generally speaking, again, for the types of evaluation we're doing, we're not, um, there's no predictive power here. And I totally understand for these that stakeholders of all kinds need to know summative findings for accountability, professional growth, resource allocation and program improvement. That hasn't changed, but we need to be more careful about it. For the evaluations that are uh, especially trying to learn of needs during the crisis for your audience, especially for vulnerable populations, I understand, again, this comes from a good place as museums and cultural organizations, we are trying to figure out what our communities need. In, but if we can't really address them in either a meaningful way from the participants' perspectives, from the audience's perspective, or if we can't act quickly, 
then why are we asking what their needs are? It's, it's can be re-traumatizing. Like think about uh, you're, you're asking them to reflect on their own vulnerability. And never mind how if it might be difficult for our organizations to uh, respond to needs quickly and meaningfully, given the probable financial and personal strain in your organization. Uh, the third item, exploring the nature of museum life when uh, some degree of normalcy returns. Uh, I just recommend steering clear of that entirely. Uh, unless you have both the need for that uh, prediction and the expertise to get it, uh, there could be a lot of flailing and misunderstandings if not approached and conducted with care. It requires a different type of uh, statistical analysis and a different kind of um, study design to even begin to address that uncertainty. Uh, the fourth, uh, I don't, again, because of the uncertainty, I don't think we will know. Um, we can start to explore the impact of the crisis uh, with mission specific topics, how important they think family learning is, or um, how important, as I said before, the uh, their conception of climate change or um, the impact of uh, humans on the environment, we can start to explore that a little bit, but we will not be able to determine it with any degree of um, certainty. And I'm going to pause here. Uh, no, I'm not. I'm moving on. Um, we'll pause here in a minute. <laughs> so the second part that uh, of the talk that I wanted to get to was balancing the many contexts, and I've alluded to this in, in, um, uh, in passing. We need to practice compassion and consider the context of our audiences and or participants. We need to practice equity in evaluation and equity in evaluation or equitable evaluation uh, is beyond the scope of this talk, but it is a step beyond culturally responsive evaluation. Um, and I'll have some resources on, on that and uh, some, and I will encourage you to, strongly encourage you to look into it in the, in the future. But um, equity and evaluation is on the same continuum as culturally responsive evaluation. It just goes further. And uh, third, um, when it comes to balancing the many contexts, you have your contexts in your organization um, that directly relate to it. So proactively talk with internal and external stakeholders to understand any changes to their situation um, and especially changes which might influence your work as uh, an evaluator or someone doing evaluation. Uh, despite the many, some questionable findings by survey companies from a human perspective, it's asking quite a lot of bandwidth from your audiences to stop their already out of balance lives to engage with you and or we experience stress. And this is where the compassion element com com uh, comes into play. Here I'm thinking of the well-meaning question from several well-meaning organizations. How are you doing? Even though I've experienced frustration with institutional review boards, and maybe many of us have, their foundational purpose is to protect participants in our studies from harm. And this includes psychological and emotional harm. I'm not suggesting that we all go through IRBs now or in the future, but what we should be thinking, uh, we should be thinking of any potential harm that can occur by reaching out, even if we're reaching out in good faith and with good intention. For example, reminding vulnerable populations of their vulnerability or asking them to expend emotional labor again so that our organizations can quote understand systematic 
and systemic inequality, it's likely that our efforts will do more harm than good. In this example, there are already many resources available on that um, look at uh, inequality, inequity, um, uh, socioeconomic studies that are already out there that we don't need to rehash with our audiences, especially at this time. So put yourself in their shoes and now imagine your grocery, your insurance company, your pet supply store, your bank, and your local arts and cultural organizations who you love are all asking questions of you. Some of those questions and some of those instruments are in oddly familial tones as if they're suddenly your best friend. And they're doing this all at once. And some of these places have even supported systems of inequity. You see where I'm going, and it's not anywhere we want to go as museums. This is not a talk on equitable evaluation, and I'm uncomfortable, to say the least, to claim any authority on the matter. I'll show you these resources. They're from publicly available reports, um, and uh, you'll be able to download them uh, from the link uh, that uh, Charity will provide. Uh, and there are a growing number of excellent resources in print and online. Uh, I'd suggest starting with uh, the resources that I'll post um, and then expand by following the Museums Are Not Neutral initiative on Twitter or exploring journal, journal articles on the topic. Uh, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. For most of us, this exploration, um, this uh, serious introspective look at uh, the Museums Are Not Neutral movement, equitable evaluation, it's not going to be a, um, it's going to be a challenging potentially painful journey, especially because we're in a predominantly white, highly educated field, which comes with so many layers of privilege. But this exploration is for a worthy purpose and we'll be better for it um, if we go through it. And uh, just to remind you that uh, to talk with your colleagues about it, depending on the purpose of evaluation, either one of the four from earlier, um, or uh, you could be doing developmental evaluation or formative evaluation. The changes that might come up with in those conversations internally uh, could be could allow you to sketch out uh, a different scope, and you'll all be able to focus better on the needs at hand. These are the resources I mentioned in the uh, previously. Um, considerations for conducting evaluation using, using a culturally responsive and racial equity lens. And this is from uh, Public Policy Associates and Michigan State University. Uh, then uh, next resource is from the American Alliance of Museums, LGBTQ welcoming guidelines, uh, specifically as it relates to evaluation. And then you have the culturally responsive research framework from Oregon's uh, Museum of Science and Industries Reveal project. Um, all of them are uh, well worth the time to read for not only uh, professional, but as I alluded to earlier, um, personal development. Uh, I'm, now I'm going to pause for real and uh, wanted to get to a question that showed up in the chat um, because sometimes we don't have enough time at the end and I don't want anyone to be rushed. Um, the question essentially states, I wonder about how we are ensuring our audiences are not overwhelmed. Yep, exactly. Uh, should we partner with others who want to collect data from the same audience? Or should we be looking at options for sharing data? Um, on the face of it, I'd say uh, yes to both. The larger, uh, there's some things to consider even with that. Uh, 
with um, partnering with others you because it's going to take more time that's just the nature of it and there has to be a commitment from the organizations involved that that is going to be the case um, and you're going to have to check with your staff to make sure that they have the bandwidth emotionally and professionally to do so um, you're going to have to maybe be transparent in ways that you typically are not uh, with or other organizations because we feel like we are in some sort of competition with each other that it's a zero sum um, scenario where we are taking uh, there's a there's a finite group of visitors and we are always taking from each other we might need to get over that some because it's proven not necessarily to be true at least in my um, geographic area uh, in Indianapolis uh, Indianapolis Indiana um, you're going as far as uh, partnering you're going to want to make sure that you have shared values again relating to that plumb bob if you have if if uh, all your plumb bobs uh, are I mean whether it's made out of um, bone stone different kinds of metal they're all going to kind of work the same because they're all going to point um, uh, to your values to the gra they're all affected by gravity right but if you're on value wise different planets they're not going to work the same they're going to be pointing to something entirely different um, so that requires a lot more conversation potentially uh, and a lot more care with regards to um, sharing data um, we'll get to that a little bit more whenever we talk about uh, data security but Again, um, some of our systems can work together fairly well. Um, some of our automated systems, I mean, but it's gonna take a lot of effort um, and again, time to get everyone in the same room to make sure that uh, these guidelines, which are not necessarily my guidelines, are guidelines that, um, I mean, I'm presenting them to you, <laughs> but um, they're guidelines that I've taken from experience and people smarter, uh, and uh, from different uh, experiences than myself. Um, so we'll get to some other uh, questions that uh, are coming up here, but I wanna move on to the other section, which uh, uh, is about prioritizing your data needs. You can't always get what you want. <laughs> and this is where we need to distinguish between wants and needs. Um, you need to, for, during this time especially, or times of crisis, you need to focus on what you need to know now versus what you want to know or might be nice to know for, uh, for the future. Um, I would highly suggest to keep those data requests small. Uh, this uh, kind of goes into, um, uh, for example, it's nice to know gender sometimes, but do you really need to know it for a specific evaluation question? For example, do um, uh, who is using your ex exhibit? Um, that's nice to know potentially, but is it really gonna affect your design of that exhibit element? or that interactive or that program? It may, I'm not saying that that's not possible, but is it your focus? Um, are you really going to use that data? Uh, a local funder here in Indianapolis, um, one of the programs I'm working, I was working with, um, we were, they wanted us to ask gender and it has nothing to do with the program uh, outcomes. It has nothing to do with the uh, evaluation questions. And I can totally understand how the organization might feel, uh, the organization that uh, is doing the evaluation, they might feel pressure from the funder to include those questions. But in this case, the funder if you look closely at the requirements, at the, at the grant requirements, there are all kinds of exceptions that you can discuss with them. 
um, when the kind of data, in this case, again, gender, um, uh, when that data is tangential to what you're doing. And so often that, uh, that is the case. It really doesn't matter. And asking that kind of information um, can then be a barrier to uh, evaluation valid validity and reliability. Uh, for once, write this down, an evaluator suggesting that you don't plan one to five years ahead, uh, enjoy that. It is my gift to you. Uh, even, even though we might, and again, this gets back to the uncertainty. If you understand the reality and accept the reality of that uncertainty, much of the data, because of the changing situations that we're dealing with, it's not, a, it can lead to misunderstandings uh, when it comes to trying to predict what's going on in the future. Uh, lastly, uh, for, the, for the focus on um, prioritizing your data needs, we all want that data and we all want it to be free. We, just because evaluation isn't happening in person, there are still tangible and intangible costs. Survey platforms, for example, can do very basic analysis for you, analysis for you. But that analysis is completely unable to, de to deal with any level of complexity. And these are indeed complex times. Uh, they can give you, again, that snapshot of what your sample looks like, what they answered at that moment, an exploration, not a determination. They are describing something in that moment, in, in those contexts. Uh, a note about incentives here, uh, because that relates to cost. Um, even if you didn't offer them before, offer them now. Uh, besides being able, besides being the equitable thing to do, your response rate and future visitor goodwill uh, will be worth it. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to affect your um, like your survey results, except it's just gonna grow your sample. It doesn't, offering incentive doesn't necessarily uh, uh, make people answer your, your survey um, measurably differently. You can focus on these data needs with your methodologies. Um, and this gets to using the right tools for your work. Uh, for exploring usage of online materials, get your evaluators and IT professionals together. Get your content creators uh, together um, from at a uh, physical, <laughs> appropriate physical distance, of course. Um, because there's so much uh, specific uh, departmental um, field specific language in these things. Evaluators don't always know what IT professionals are talking about and vice versa. Same thing with the content creators and the um, exhibition developers. I mean, this is good practice generally, and I do know of many museums that do this, but it's even more important here for online materials. For example, um, you might say uh, as an IT professional, well, you, the kind of data we can give you are views, downloads, and shares, um, and times of what's going on. Like when all this is happening, maybe an IP, so you get uh, some geographic data, uh, and of course, browser data, what they're using. But see, all of that, it starts to like degenerate into noise. Um, the eva having the evaluator in the room, you start to um, uh, maybe think, well, each view is a person right? Well, maybe it's multiple people viewing that at one time. Maybe it's just a, a uh, crawler bot that's indexing the information auto, uh, through an automated process from Google or Bing or uh, any of the indexing pl um, programs uh, on the internet. 
And never mind, there's not always a one-to-one -one ratio of visitor use for these things. Um, views, downloads, and shares are not equal in their engagement level necessarily. The usage is completely different from in-person programs, exhibitions, and interpretation programs. So I'm suggesting that we be very careful with our claims uh, and even though they can still be very instructive if set up and interpreted correctly by having those people in the room together or on the, in the Zoom room together. Um, online surveys still have a function, but they need supplement because uh, remember, we're keeping them short, we're keeping them focused. Um, and we'll get to several different ways to uh, supplement that data even if they're not necessarily linked with um, like specific participants. Uh, thoughtful design is even more important with our surveys than ever uh, in this time and in these contexts. Uh, don't ask the same question two or three ways from different angles. For example, <laughs> providing um, like a text box um, that asked, asked an open, like an open question. Um, and maybe you'll get uh, s several respondents that give you like rich, super rich data there. But really what you want, <laughs> especially in this time, you, you have a certain series of questions. And uh, so I've seen surveys that appear to have as their value. Um, we're going to get at that. We don't think people are going to answer either honestly or completely. So we're gonna try and come at this from multiple different ways. So we'll ask it with an open-ended uh, question and then a multiple choice question. Uh, don't do that. Um, shouldn't be doing it anyway <laughs> for most things, um, but uh, especially right now. And when you're providing those multiple choices uh, in, in for those kinds of questions or ranking options, have them make eternal, uh, uh, kind of internal sense and logic um, and, and be clear to people. If I'm struggling to understand what the options mean, that is not a good sign for the question uh, validity, for the uh, option validity. It's, it's gonna mess up your, your survey. Uh, paper surveys. So uh, consider old school data collection methods and new ways of listening to your visitors uh, both. So that could be paper surveys, focus groups, um, by secure chat online or by phone. Um, but other sources can be used as well, whether you're, you could do it by email, um, postal mail, text, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, um, if you have the expertise. Again, this, this, is, this isn't a time necessarily to feel bad if your museum doesn't have um, people in place with that expertise. It's a time to, if you want to uh, build that capacity, you can still get there. Um, unfortunately, we'll probably have another crisis at some point and these skills, uh, this inve investment in these skills will pay dividends, uh, not only now, but also in the future. Um, as far as new ways of listening to your visitors, you can analyze social media, social media posts through discourse analysis or text analysis. Um, audiences could submit videos, short videos uh, through TikTok. You, if you're looking at um, a flexible way for them to respond that's outside of surveys. Uh, you could ask visitors to submit mind maps in response to a prompt. Some of these things, of course, become more complex to analyze, but they are more flexible on the um, audience side to submit. But some of these things, because of their very, some of these methodologies, because of their uh, inherent nature, it becomes even more important to keep data security and audience privacy as a priority. Suddenly, instead of just a paper survey, which may or may not have on the back end a bunch of triangulation data, um, as far as giving them, giving uh, the institution knowledge of the kind of device that they're using, the uh, general location of that device, et cetera, 
Um, aside from those kinds of things, now you might have images of children or images of uh, any sort of vulnerable population or people. You've got all of a sudden faces, real faces and real voices. And this is again where I start to look at um, IRB practices. Uh, if you would have asked me um, if, you know, I guess it's uh, fifth, how many years ago now? 11 years ago um, in grad school, how excited, well, first of all, would I ever be promoting um, the uh, extreme carefulness uh, around IRB data practices. Um, I can't imagine that I would have thought that that would ever be happening. Um, but we're in a different world now for sure. And um, there are all kinds of ways to mine that data um, in ethical ways that I hope that museums and uh, uh, informal learning environments that we are practicing, but there's all kinds of ways to mine that data in unethical ways that I know are also going on um, by uh, uh, other companies, um, uh, which is another talk, like I said. Um, lastly, know the limits of your methodologies. The predictive power for example, thinking of the back to the types of evaluation that are going like we want to know what normal, whatever, I hesitate to use that word so much, but what normal will look like, okay, when we can reopen, okay. The predictive power of what things will be like post lockdown is severely limited by the uncertainty that surrounds all of us, but also by the types of study design. Most evaluation studies are descriptive snapshots. They use descriptive uh, statistics methodologies. And the those kinds of statistics are specifically not predictive. This is a fundamental difference between <laughs> descriptive stats and inferential stats. And forgive me for those of you that are uh, very familiar with this. Um, I feel like for some audiences that are in museums, they might not understand this or might not have ever been exposed to it. Um, uh, at best, and this is still useful, uh, descriptive stats show correlations and effects at that time and in that place. And this can be super useful for all kinds of departments um, and all kinds of uh, evaluations, whether uh, summative, remedial, etc. Um, it can give us a general idea of the, uh, again, exploring. <laughs> uh, but let's not misplace our trust in what evaluation, as generally practiced by most evaluators, can actually predict. Uh, and this would be the case even without the current uncertainty. Uh, so uh, the last part of the talk here is about rebalancing all this. We've, we've got you know, knowing what you're doing with the, the eval, balancing the context, prioritizing your data needs, focusing on those needs with your methodology. And then you still need to come back and rebalance because we all have our um, unknown and known implicit biases um, that are either within ourselves, within our organizations, um, within the systems in which we move. And those factors influence our results. Uh, just to give a, a brief example, if you're trying to survey uh, teachers to see how they're using your online materials, okay? Um, which is, again, a perfectly reasonable thing, at least according, uh, <laughs> according to most folks, uh, and funders wanna know, our boards wanna know, et cetera. Um, it's a perfectly reasonable thing to be doing on the face of it um, so that we know where to put our money, where do we, where do we spend our time as content creators, um, as uh, people that are, again, working for the public good. So we send out these surveys uh, to teachers 
And the thing is, uh, so as far as the context, let's, and if, and this is assuming we are very focused with our question, um, the context is these teachers are now, um, many of them dealing with uh, online realms that they have very little experience with because they haven't had to. And uh, the fact of the matter is um, they shouldn't have to. Uh, you deal with, we are humans. <laughs> we having face-to-face -face conversations, face-to-face -face observations, face-to-face um, -face relationships is how we best operate. It takes so much time for now the teachers to set up all these videos, um, uh, find a way to do some sort of um, assessment of where the students are at, making sure that they are, um, that the students are treated in a compassionate way. And again, the teachers that I'm seeing, uh, they are doing, uh, doing a wonderful job with this. But all this takes massive amounts of time, um, more, even more time than traditional planning uh, would take uh, if they if the schools were open they these teachers aren't going to necessarily have the um, the time or the emotional bandwidth to fill out your survey about your online content um, because then they'd have to go check out all the, all the content that you've made right um, and that's just from your uh, well-meaning uh, organization what about all, all the different museums that are sending out uh, science videos on this or, or read alouds, uh, going through different books, going through virtual tours? Um, it starts to, again, be a stress point because of course the teachers, one of that, you know, they know, <laughs> I, speaking from personal experience, they know how it uh, feels um, to potentially be undervalued. Um, like museums many times are. Um, so how do we address this? We rebalance it. Uh, and one of the ways that I'm suggesting are uh, participatory evaluation methods. They can help mitigate inequity of privilege. Um, they can help mitigate some of these content, uh, contexts. Um, again, this isn't a talk on um, participatory evaluation. Um, but uh, even, for example, involving a small group of representative and compensated audience members to offer validation and checks on your personal and organizational perceptions. This is a good practice in general, but it does take more time and energy from everyone. If approached with transparency and care, it will be well worth it with stronger findings and stronger ties to your audience. Uh, again, thinking about access and privilege, mobile internet access is widespread, but not necessarily everywhere. And this includes um, access, not just from device, but services, okay? Rural areas, uh, people in uh, mid to low socioeconomic uh, status levels, people working with multiple jobs, uh, working as caregivers and homeschooling children, it might not matter that they have a smartphone and a reliable connection if they lack the time and energy. Never mind that smartphone uh, needs to have consistent updates and both uh, all the major uh, smartphone makers kind of stop supporting their, pro their products after two or three years with security updates. And some of that affects functionality beyond security. So now you have someone using an older smartphone, even if they have one, um, that is that potentially might not even work very well with Zoom or uh, Microsoft Teams or Skype or whatever. Which gets to the third point, make sure if you're sending out instruments, that they are mobile friendly. I've seen some large um, uh, uh, survey platforms that end with tricks <laughs> that are not necessarily mobile friendly. It again takes time get, uh, to test that across browsers, but if you're sending out the survey, you're still following the guidelines um, that I've seen and kind of put together for you here. Um, and 
your instrument doesn't render properly or it's hard to navigate things overlap it's kind of a wasted effort again get your IT professionals in the same room with your evaluators um, so that you can test these things uh, findings may be slow to come in given people's priorities, which oddly enough are not yours or mine, uh, especially uh, from or in organizations. So we're gonna have to practice patience. Uh, generally speaking, whenever you get put out an online survey with your, your responses come in within a week, maybe within a couple days before they fall off someone's radar, right? Um, it might require you to wait longer. Um, it might require also for you not to send uh, reminders uh, in quite so uh, insistent of a way, um, even if you're being, even if you're being kind about it. Okay, um, especially in these times, the last thing people knew need right now is another to-do list. Um, again, with uh, participatory evaluation we want to make these findings as rigorous as possible when we have to do evaluation. Um, and, but we need that rigor and that care, especially now. We need to be intentional in every stage, especially now, especially in times of crisis. If we allow the sample to be built in a way that's not representative, or if we use methods that exclude voices that have been historically excluded or not valued, it hides problems. It hides problems in the system. It supports systems of inequity. Evaluation, and this is my personal soapbox, and uh, when it, especially when it comes to um, equitable evaluation. Uh, evaluation should be in the service of equity, and the ways that evaluation is done should clearly show the principles of that equity. Uh, I really appreciate the time that uh, you all have taken to um, explore this. Uh, I know we're coming from all different places uh, in our uh, professional lives and in our personal lives. If you have additional questions, please reach out, um, especially if you have ideas or comments. Um, you can reach me at Jeremy, J-E-R-E-M-Y, at steamworkgroup.com. I'm also um, uh, on Twitter at steamworkgroup, and of course, our website, steamworkgroup.com. Great. Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, great presentation. You covered a lot uh, of questions I feel that people have. Um, I've been kind of tracking what's happening in the chat, but also in our Q&A, uh, and have a few questions for you. Um, I first wanted to address one of the things you just mentioned, you know, as a methodology, the participatory evaluation as an option, while it takes, may take longer, it might be a better approach uh, in this situation. So, and, and I don't know if a good example of that to share, in case our, uh, any audience members don't know what that is, um, that if there's a program you're considering or want to pilot um, that you in, involve the audience, members of the audience in development of that program and try it out with them. And as you develop it with mm -hmm. them, you'll learn about their perspectives and, and uh, relation to that versus just evaluating them after it's been developed. Is that, is that a pretty good summary of, of what participatory evaluation kind of looks like? Um, yeah, it can take a lot of different forms. Um, it's harder whenever you're talking about prototyping um, uh, physical objects. It's a little easier with programs. Um, it's going to be more difficult in these times just because we, it's going to be more exchange. You're going to have more back and forth, um, potentially. Uh, but yeah, involving them in all stages. Uh, that can also mean having a small team, one of the projects that I'm working on right now, uh, I've right from the beginning had them look at our logic model what are the outcomes do the outcomes align with your experience do you think they're achievable in any sense i'm gonna they will be looking at the instrument and some of this you know you could see is uh, well you're you're allowing audience to kind of see behind the curtain um 
And I guess I, I can sympathize with that uh, thought, but I'm still asking a lot of my audience, uh, of, of this team, and they are compensated. Um, I've heard of uh, programs on, in the health evaluation field done here locally, uh, where they had uh, team members in the community that organize, that helped with data collection. Um, that could be a great thing to do with participatory evaluation in this context. And that would allow you, like if you have someone that has any, you can give them a, a very um, quick training on uh, how to run uh, or how to conduct an interview and have them call. Uh, that would, that's, and that's one, another layer of participatory evaluation. Uh, you can, and we're going to involve, again, with a, another project that I'm, I'm doing, participants will be able to help code the, some of the open-ended data. Oh. Um, it's, it allows uh, greater, not only greater engagement with your participants, it increases buy-in, and it makes the, the findings uh, more rigorous overall. Okay, thank you. Um, so getting to some questions from our audience members today. Um, one person has submitted a question of, is this a time to survey former museum members to see why they have left, they might have left, and if they would consider returning when the new normal settles in? So this, I know, relates to some of the points you had about um, kind of understanding the impact of the crisis on people's lives, but. Well, so my initial, that, that's the kind of question that uh, most organizations want to know generally um, at, at any, any time, right? Um, I don't think that you'll get a very clear picture, even with a large sample size. Um, if that is a, a burning, question for your organization that like that determines the ability to staff or not like the ability to reopen then i would i would consider asking it um but if it unless it relates to it, it, i can't think of another scenario um with that specific question. I mean, there's all kinds of, uh, there's some work being done that's trying to, and we're all trying to figure out uh, intent to visit after uh, the lockdown is lifted, after it's safe to gather. Um, I don't know how, <laughs> uh, how reliable that's going to be. Um, some of these studies that I've seen from big, big groups, um, uh, they released these, these reports and the reports are from three weeks ago. Well, three weeks ago was a completely different situation, right? We mm -hmm. didn't know nearly the extent. Um, it, we weren't dealing with a hundred, we just didn't have the information that we do now. That study on intent to visit from three weeks ago is kind of, I don't want to say useless because it's almost worse than that. It, it can be misleading. Um, so I would be very, very hesitant unless it strongly aligns with a direct need, not a want, but a need, uh, I would avoid it. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, another question was, how do we ensure audiences are not overwhelmed? You know, should we consider partnering with others who are surveying the same audience or sharing data with one another? Uh, I'm all for responsibly sharing data with cultural institutions, um, evaluation data or not. I know they're, you know, we're all competing in some sense um, uh, for the same visitors, um, but that doesn't always pan out the way that we think. Um, and there's all kind, of, there's various studies that show that. Um, I'm, I guess I'm. I'm very, cons it's totally possible to do it. Uh, I'm just, if it, get, it comes back to how can we avoid not overwhelming people 
well, you just, you don't bother them. <laughs> um, but uh, if you find, if you know a local partner that, um, that has alignment with your mission, absolutely get together with them. Um, again, it's going to take more time, right? But it's, would you rather invest that time or do harm or burn bridges with your audience? Um, it's just, it, to me, uh, again, from my privileged position as an evaluator, as, as an external evaluator, uh, it's easy for me, easier for me to say that. Right. Good point. Uh, we've had a person write in to the chat um, with a question to everyone, but I'm going to put this out here to you as well. Um, you know, she said they're, they've been asked to do a survey for the express purpose of wealth distribution. The project has funding and they're conscious that fam families are struggling right now, um, but they're being encouraged internally to continue the research and pay participants incentives, but there's questions of whether or not um, those incentives are appropriate, uh, you know, just generally in, in evaluation, but also in this moment, um, does it influence how people respond? Um, so how might you recommend people handle incentives, I guess? Uh, well, I definitely, um, I can understand um, if you're, uh, so, so there's always going to be a social desirability bias um, whenever we're, um, uh, we people want to give answers uh, unless they're really agitated um, at the company or organization. They want to give answers uh, uh, that please or are helpful um, to the organization. Uh, incentives don't really affect uh, that part of the equation. Whether or not they might affect it now. Um, how grateful am I if I get $20 whenever um, I'm out of work right now? I, I don't know. I don't see that as really affecting it, but at the same time, we don't know. That's the fact of the matter. Um, as for the survey purpose, ah, uh, that's, well, <laughs> well there's, there's a lot <laughs> that could be choked problematic with uh, doing a survey about wealth distribution right now. Um, uh, my il initial in, uh, thought is that it's not going to give you reliable results. Um, and if it's not going to give you reliable uh, results or valid results because of the complexity that I've talked about, I don't even know how, how to go. I, I wouldn't do the survey. Uh, I would ask to postpone it, basically. Um, uh, ask for a no-cost extension if it's, you know, depending on the funder. Um, uh, I would rather have, I assume, again, some funders act, are acting, are good actors here, some are not, but I'd assume that if that was explained to them um, in a clear way, that they would much rather have a reliable and valid a series of findings than something that's uh, produced very quickly, but not actually useful. Jeremy, um, Marie, who sent in that question, offered a clarif clarification on it. I guess they're being asked to do it because they can distribute wealth, because they can pay people, that it might be helpful to do the research right now. And I think... Um, oh. I thought it was on wealth distribution. Oh my. Yeah. Huh. I don't know. Uh, I'll have to think about that. Um, that's complicated. <laughs> well, Marie, we can follow up with, with you after the webinar today. Yeah, and other people, I would, I would be interested to see what other people thought um, because uh, I, as I try to say, I am uh, certainly, it makes me very nervous to be considered an authority on not much of anything. <laughs> um, well, uh, I yeah, I bet you're taken by surprise. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's okay. Uh, uh, it sounds like Marie's experiencing the same level of surprise with it too. So, um, 
you know, we're at 11 o'clock. I did want to address a question that came in through um, the registration form, just related to prototyping. You know, Jeremy, you've, you've addressed there are different ways of getting feedback right now. If there's, and I just want to kind of share with this my thoughts as an exhibits professional. Mm -hmm. If you are trying to do prototyping while the museum is closed and get feedback virtually on things, that's tricky because it boils down to what it is you wanted to know about that prototype. Um, and if it's a hands-on thing, you're not going to be able to get the feedback you would if you were in person trying to test it. If you're interested in, does it work or, you know, will it fail kind of things. If you just want feedback on people's interest in that type of activity, you could have a demonstration video made and, and share it and, um, you know, through social media and get just general feedback. I, I can't say that that's, you know, that might be similar to what you would hear if you were on site testing, you know, collecting qualitative responses to the idea. But um, it will be tricky. If you wait till you reopen um, and visitors are coming in and you're trying to collect data while they're on site, um, know that their experience in your museum, you know, and what their concerns and um, uh, background they're coming with um, at that point is going to be different, uh, at least initially. So you might want right. to keep all of that in mind. And, but and um, you know, whenever you're again, whenever you're doing online online data collection of any kind, uh, mindfulness of building the sample mm -hmm. and access and equity become even more important because. Um, Oh, I have the time to write up my detailed thoughts about how this, about my interest, or how I might think this might work. Um, but if uh, I'm uh, walking my uh, child through, you know, online tests and assessments for school, I might not have uh, might not have the bandwidth. Um, if I'm working multiple, if I'm st an essential personnel somewhere, which in Indiana includes, of course, uh, um, liquor stores. So there's that. Um, but if I'm work, if I'm working in an essential um, location, then I'm, I might not have, uh, your, your sample is harmed. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I uh, see other comments coming in. I do want to try to end us on time here. I, uh, would recommend that anybody ha that has a follow-up question uh, for uh, us or for Jeremy, you know, you're welcome to send an email. We will follow up with you um, once we have materials gathered to, to share with you post-webinar, and um, you're welcome to reply to that with further questions, um, or contact me at ccounts at midwestmuseums.org. Uh, I'll type my email address uh, into the the chat box here in a moment before we go. Um, thanks so much for participating today. Jeremy, thank you for uh, being our expert and, you know, to answer questions today. Uh, much appreciated. Um, very, Careful, very good. Expert. I don't know. I, um, I have experience. <laughs> you do. Yes. Um, well, thanks again. I hope everybody has a great rest of their Tuesday and um, stay tuned for follow-up information.